Welcome, everybody, to Frank Family Vineyards uh, Rutherford Reserve Retrospective Tasting. I'm Leslie Frank, proprietor of Frank Family Vineyards. We've got some special guests today, but before I introduce them, I want to talk a little bit about how this hour is going to go. So we want to keep it interactive. If you have questions, ask in the Q&A section, in the chat section. We also want to see if you're going to... Uh, pay attention for the next hour because we've got some trivia questions and what do you get if you are the first person to answer that trivia question you get a hundred dollar gift certificate to use on our shop site to purchase any frank family wine or merchandise and we also have a poll at the end so you want to stay tuned but right now i want to introduce to you our special guest today we have with us Winemaker Todd Graff, Liam Garrity, our Director of Hospitality and Direct to Consumer Sales, and very special guest, Davey Pina, who is the owner of Pina Vineyard Management, who takes care of our Winston Hill Vineyard, as well as our Benjamin Vineyard in Rutherford. Uh, I'm going to start with Liam. Why don't you tell us what we'll be tasting today? We've gone into the library and we pulled out some very spe special vintages of Rutherford Reserve wine. Why don't you take it away? Thanks, Leslie. Uh, we do. We have three great uh, Cabernet Sauvignons uh, from Frank Family Vineyards, uh, uh, two years apart on each one, starting with the 2008 vintage Rutherford Reserve, the 2010 and then the 2012 uh, Rutherford Reserve. So three fabulous Cabernets, each one with a little bit of time in between them, which we can talk about uh, the progression of these wines as we go through them. Okay, why don't we start? Um, I know that you have uh, the Corbin with you today, Liam, and you're gonna demonstrate how we open these wines. Why don't we start with the 2008? Great. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things we offered with this package, because these are fabulous wines and wines that have been given um, consideration in terms of aging. Um, these are wines that we may want to sample and then make a decision on whether that be to pull the trigger on it now, open the bottle and start drinking it, or um, to hang on to it and let it develop a little bit more. That may be the case for the 08 or the 10 or the 12. Uh, the beautiful thing about the Coravin is that it allows us to extract a little bit of wine out of the bottle. Uh, give it a try, take an ounce or two to sample, see where that wine is on its journey, and then make a judgment call, whether that judgment call be great, but I'd love to see where this can keep going, or yes, I love it right where it is. Um, this will give us that opportunity. So a quick word about Frank Family's bottles and the way we do them. Every bottle uh, of this reserve wine, um, beginning with the 09, so not so much on the 08, but with the uh, 10 and the 12, um, for a bit of an aesthetic, our bottles are topped with a small uh, dollop of wax. It's a, a beautiful uh, look for the wine and a, a great way to store the wine with that wax cap on. Now, if you were gonna open a bottle to drink it, it's not a problem at all. It's very easy with your corkscrew just to push through that wax and, uh, and keep driving it through the cork to open it just like you would any other bottle. However, if you're planning on corvinning and using the Corvin uh, uh, unit to extract some wine, um, I think it's best to take that uh, dollop off only because uh, the wax going in and out, the needle could get clogged or it could bend. So uh, just real quickly, if you're gonna do this at home, I have my corkscrew here. I've gone down about two turns and then just real easy like I was opening a beer. I just kind of pop it off, just like that. Take the dollop off, set it aside. Now the wine is still uh, 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 safe. The cork is still intact, but we can use that Corvin unit a lot easier. Uh, if you have one of these at home and you want to do this now, a quick demonstration, it's not that hard. Use the clamp to put over the neck of the bottle. Gently push the needle down. This button right here, this is uh, what injects a small amount of argon gas uh, into the bottle. And as argon is moving into the bottle, the same needle is extracting a small amount of wine out. What's great about argon gas and the reason why it's a part of this unit is that it's actually, it's heavier. It's an inert gas, but it's heavier than oxygen. So what it does is it essentially forms a, a, a gaseous layer that sits in between where the wine ends and where the oxygen in the bottle begins. This is why the bottle will continue to age appropriately for months or, or even years um, after you've used the Corvin on it. So once that needle is in, just a small push on that lever and the wine comes out. If you want more wine, do it again. 
If you want a bigger pour, hold the button down longer. But for me, if I'm going to start drinking a bottle, I'm just going to go ahead and open it. Uh, the Corvin for me is really just an opportunity to sample the wine, easily remove the needle, and you're all set. The bottle will, again, continue to age as long as you like in the cellar. And doesn't the uh, Corvin needle move each time you do it? Does it have a rotation on it? The needle So it doesn't go into the same hole in the cork? Exactly right. Anytime you want to take that off, you can see just with the uh, 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 on the cork there, you'll see a little bit where the needle has gone through. If you do plan on using the needle multiple times on the same bottle, I think it's a good idea to go into a different place. But you know, for me, the Corbin is really about sampling the wine, understanding where it is on its journey, and then letting that information um, um, lead you in your decision making. Uh, if, if, if you've got a case of wine and you've been sitting on that case and wondering when the right time to drink it is, you may pull a bottle out, take a, a small sample out and say, yes, this is this is what I was hoping for out of this wine. In that case, fire it up, drink it up. It's ready to go. Liam, I have a question from uh, Chris and Bob Hilton. They're asking, does Frank Family sell the Coravin? And if not, where can I get one? Yeah, so we do. We have a wonderful partnership with this, with this company, Coravin, and we use them in the tasting room every day. For us in the tasting room, it gives us an opportunity to share one of these rare library wines with guests uh, uh, without worrying about uh, opening that bottle. Um, we can uh, 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 send one right to you. We have a number of packages online uh, tasting packages that feature the Corvin. Uh, we do uh, the unit with um, with our estate tasting. So receive a bottle of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Zinfandel, and Cab. Take a Corvin, or, or we'll send a Corvin to you as well. And then uh, uh, we can do one of our virtual tastings, give you an opportunity to taste those wines along with one of our wine educators uh, without committing to opening that bottle. So it's a great opportunity. You can find that information on our website, Leslie. I think that it's time that we taste the 2008. Great. What do you think? Not gonna get an argument. No argument from you, Todd. Todd, as we as we taste this wine, can you walk us through the 08 vintage? Um, maybe a little bit about the tasting notes, and then um, I want to ask Davy uh, after that what it was like as a grower in 2008. Was it a challenging year? What were the characteristics of that growing year? But let's start with you, Todd, and Great. what we're tasting. Well, um, I'll go. So this is where we made the wine before we grew it, actually. So uh, yeah. usually we let Davy go because he, he had to grow it. And then I, his hands are dirty. My feet are purple. So uh, <laughs> um, we go that way. But uh, the, uh, the 08 is uh, it's 12 years old now, correct? If I'm doing my math right. And uh, it is starting to show a little signs of that nice bottle bouquet. I get a lot of uh, a fruit leather. You remember those old candy roll-ups you had when yeah. you were a kid? Um, you're starting to get a little bit of dried fruit character and a little new leather um, in it to where it's starting to show it's 12 years. It's earned that time. And um, as Liam said, with a Corbin, you could do that. You can see it not. If you've bought several bottles of this, you open it over time and see when you start liking it. So it still has, I'd say, another few five years left in it. But now I think it's reaching its peak. I'm really enjoying this. So you, you still have this nice fruit flavor, very soft in the palate. And the aromatics are, are again, are fruit, maybe a little sore uh, in there, um, a little fruit leather, and, and just really plush and soft. Yeah, there's a savory component to this wine that I get too, Todd. Something that's almost like a, a sun-dried tomato. Uh, not, uh, the soy umami like um, a really unique character that, that I think is showing up due to the time in the wine. And it's, it's very typical with when you get into a Cabernet and, and aging it over 10 years. You start moving from the fresh fruit that we'll see in the younger wines here to more of a dried fruit character. So I want to turn it over to Davey. Um, Davey, first of all, we're really excited to have you here with us. You know this property, this Winston Hill property, where we're broadcasting live from today, probably better than anyone else. You have been our vineyard manager as long as Frank family has been in existence. So over 28 years now, you, you've been um, managing the vines on this property. Yeah. Um, but a little bit about you. Um, you have very deep roots in Napa Valley. Talk about uh, your family and, and just your background as a, as a grower. Well, thank you, Leslie, and thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor to be able to be participate in this. Uh, yeah, I, uh, my family came to Napa Valley in 1857. Uh, I am the fourth generation to be born and raised in Napa Valley, and we've got a couple more 
generations behind us. Um, so I've been around for a long time. I grew up in the vineyards uh, and I went off to college. And beyond that, I've always been in Oakville or Rutherford my whole life. What did your family farm before grapes? They were truck farmers. They watermelons, tomatoes, they did walnuts, prunes. Uh, they did all, uh, all the vegetables. They did all that kind of stuff. They farmed the ground. They great. farmed the dirt. They farmed the dirt. And whatever was growing good at that time. And they always made wine. They always had some sort of alcohol. Uh, but uh, my dad was uh, loved to make his wine. It was pretty rough stuff when he made it because it had to be, the harvest had to be over. And so then he'd pick the second crop and he'd make a second crop out of, you know, Bricks for 32, 34, I, you know. Really See, it all comes around again. Comes around again. <laughs> That's it, yes. Uh, yeah. With regards to 2008, uh, Davey, how would you describe the growing year and were there challenges in that year? It was a year that had a, a lot of rain. Uh, and it, we were looking at the records and in, in it was uh, March we had the last rain. Is that the year when your records? Uh, it didn't really have much more. It was, oh, it was uh, January, heavy, heavy January. December and January. Yeah, and, and so the, the issue with uh, especially the, the vines on the hill is when they get that much water, they love to grow. Uh, there's not much soil on this hillside. There's not a lot of water holding capacity. But when you saturate the soils, the vines grow very vigorously. And the problem with that is that they grow too much. You have too many, too many leaves, too many shoots. you got to uh, shoot thin, you got to leaf thin, you've got to do a lot of manipulation to get the light into the clusters. And the other problem with this is that when the rains stop and you've got a long dry season, these are big plants now and you've got to keep feeding them water to keep them going. Uh, otherwise they start to collapse on you. So when you have a dry year, it's not, they don't need as much water because they're not as big. So there's several problems you have to work on. Todd, from a winemaking perspective, was 2008 a challenging year? Well, it, it is a challenging year to, to make sure that all the farming goes correctly. And that's why it's great to have Davey and his team here to, to do the, the heavy lifting there. Our decisions are always made, made off of mother nature. You know, there, it's not the same every year. So we don't just set our calendar and say, okay, we picked middle of October uh, last year. We're gonna pick middle of October again. This, so 08 was actually a, a relatively early year uh, because we had a very hot uh, and warm spring and hot summer. So even though we got a lot of rain, so you add a lot of that water and then you add some heat and thus the growth again too. So it was a perfect time for growth, but so it was an early season. And the one common vineyard for all these grapes is this Winston Hill Vineyard. Now we've added some of our neighbors, which is it was kind of fun here in Rutherford, um, so in 2008, we put a little blend of our neighbors at Red Barn, which is across um, the, the creek here um, that we can see. And when you're up on the top of the hill, I actually can look down on their vineyards and I can see how they're growing. And I could tell two ends of the vineyards grew differently just by the color of the vines. Mm -hmm. And so thus, when you go down there, it's harder to see it when you're in the vineyard than when you're above it. So. Um, from then on, we've always picked half the vineyard at one time and half the vineyard at a different time. And that was just a, a view that we got from up here. So we added a red barn in 2008. And then, and then in 2010, again, Winston Hill being the majority of it, then we added a quarry vineyards, which is our neighbors to the north here on the same side of the Silverado Trail, great family. And then in 12, we had the red barn to quarry, and then we added Andy Beckstoffer's George III um, to the blend also. And uh, it's been in there ever since. So uh, uh, Winston Hill Foundation, and then a couple of our neighbors in there to make the Rutherford blend. So as I mentioned, we're broadcasting from Winston Hill. We are inside our red barn uh, that sits on Winston Hill. And the reason we're broadcasting inside today is because there is rain in the forecast today. And we didn't want to be sitting outside and getting wet, yeah. obviously. Uh, what does rain this time of year mean for the vines, Davey? Uh, well, it's, um, it's probably not going to be a huge impact right now because the vines are at the tail end of bloom. Uh, it might not even be, a, might even be a good thing because 
when you have a, a cluster that blooms, you, uh, it blooms from basically the core of the, the cluster all the way out to the ends. And some winemakers like to get rid of those uh, grapes that are a little bit behind the main core of the cluster. So if the rain comes along and knocks off those blooms and they don't ripen correctly, it's the best thing, It'll, they, they'll be gone. Uh, other than that, we have to stay on our spray schedules to make sure we don't get too much moisture in the canopy and get too much mildew. Um, we can work out a lot of things. It just depends on what follows up behind this. If we get dry weather, you, there won't be any problem at all. If we keep this rain and keep the humidity up, we're going to have to really work at it. Okay. Liam, behind you is a map of Winston Hill. And maybe you can point out the folks at home where we are sitting and the vineyard and just kind of give them a little, a little sure. picture, a little demonstration of Winston Hill <laughs> and Cabernet. Yeah, so Winston Hill, the Winston Hill Vineyard, 25 acres uh, rising up the hillside uh, uh, of Rutherford on the, um, on the eastern slope um, facing the setting sun. Uh, we are physically right here in uh, uh, one of the barns of the Winston Hill Vineyard. Cabernet is planted uh, throughout the, the three sections of Winston Hill, the high, the heart, and then the low uh, vineyard. Cabernet Sauvignon uh, uh, towards the bottom of the hill, <coughs> adjacent to Silverado Trail, as well as a little bit of Cab Franc, which is Cab Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, two grapes that come from the Bordeaux family, the, the family of grapes that, that uh, originated in, in Bordeaux, France, alongside uh, Petit Bordeaux, um, Malbec, and Merlot. So Cabernet Sauvignon here, Cab Franc here, Cabernet Sauvignon here and here, and then at the very top of Winston Hill, and, and some of you who are uh, members of our Winston Hill Club will know this wine, the Winston Hill Sangiovese, uh, uh, originally an Italian varietal that we grow at the very top of Winston Hill, uh, and, a, and a fabulous grape that we uh, uh, make wine out of in, in a very small amount because 100% of that fruit is coming from that very high vineyard at the top. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask you a question because you said this earlier, and, uh, when you were looking down at that red barred vineyard and noticing how the, the, the leaves were changing and the vineyard was, was behaving differently, it's, I think it's an important point to make that even though uh, we are using a purchased fruit component in this wine, we're not buying just straight fruit from a grower. We have say in the way that vineyard operates, right? Correct. We do have say in how it's farmed, but then the ultimate picking decision also is rests on my shoulders. That's great. So, yeah, so we, we have the final say on when it gets picked. And as most, and then we work with them, and, and it's it's a it's a partnership, it's a relationship. So we're out there throughout the whole growing season, talking to them. We have the growers up for tastings after we make the wines. We have them taste their wines. We we have the communication post harvest too. Is like what could have we done better right. next year? And then Mother Nature throws a curveball, so those rules all go out. <laughs> and then we have another meeting after harvest. So uh, so it really is collaborative. In it, it's it's so this whole valley works that way. Yeah. I think it's important to mention that at Frank Family Vineyards, we are certified Napa Green. But for those of you at home, and I know Davey can explain this better than I can, what does it mean exactly to be Napa Green in the vineyard, Davey? Well, it, it means that uh, you analyze everything you do in the vineyard, from uh, the, the chemicals you apply, the work you do, the erosion runoff that you do. You try and make everything softer, less impact. Um, you uh, try and keep the soil where it is. You don't want anything running off the hillside. Uh, you analyze it every year, see which things that you can improve upon every year. Right. Todd, I absolutely love this 08 um, Cabernet. And, and you know, one of the things that really strikes me when I have the opportunity to drink older cabs is just in terms of the transformation that takes place, not only are we really uh, on our palates able to experience that flavor transformation where the fruit moves into that dry place and some of those more terroir or earth driven notes come out. But in, in terms of the physicality of the wine, this feels a lot rounder and a lot suppler on the palate. Um, uh, acid and tannins, of course, two you know, big components in, in Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, they're getting a little softer in time, aren't they? Yeah, of course they do. Over the time, the oxygen, oxygenation, <laughs> oxygen into the wines um, will help soften those tannins. Yeah, and, this, so, and that just takes time. Yeah, this feels and it's a, incredibly it's a, elegant. Yeah, very really silky. I want to say um, we have a shout outs from some of our viewers watching today. Carol Wason from Maryland, uh, Ken Darish from Hubbard Lake, Michigan, 
We've got uh, Jason Davis from San Diego. Andy Swanson says he popped the 06 to go with the 08, the 10, and the 12. Right. And he says, whoop, awesome. whoop. So I think that means it's, it's drinking great. Um, Aaron Luckett, hi, Aaron, says that she loves the Sangiovese, which Liam was referring to at the top of uh, Winston Hill Vineyard. Okay, I think it is time for a trivia question. Marissa, what do you think? I think I'm right. Okay, and remember, <laughs> the first person... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, can we put the trivia question on the screen or no? No, I'll just ask the question. The first person to answer the question in the chat section, sorry, to answer the question correctly in the chat section, um, will win a $100 gift certificate to use uh, on our shop site at frankfamilyvineyards.com uh, for any wine or merchandise. And the first question is, of the vineyards sourced for our Rutherford Reserve, which is Frank family's estate vineyard? This is an easy one, guys. <laughs> oh boy, that, oh boy. Wait, wait, wait. Who's the first person? Marissa, can you see that in the chat section? Looks like it was Robert Russo. Robert, Robert Russo, Russo. Nice. you got it right. Yes, it's Winston Hill. That was an easy one. <laughs> um, Robert Russo, yay, Robert. $100 to go towards uh, the purchase of uh, anything Frank family. Uh, Marissa McCann, our marketing manager, will reach out to you via email to electronically send you your gift certificate. Okay, Liam, you're up again. Let's move on to the 2010 Rutherford Reserve and maybe another demonstration with the core of it. Sure, just once again, uh, for the 10, it's... The 10 is uh, uh, the bottle that we have in our lineup today that does have that wax cap. So I've already popped it off. And again, uh, the reason why I recommend that, if you're gonna use the Corbin once on a bottle, the wax isn't gonna be an issue, but the more often you try to um, uh, pierce that wax dollop, the more chances you run of either clogging the mechanism inside the needle or potentially uh, bending that needle, which is, um, which is not what you wanna do. So a quick turn of the corkscrew two down, pop the top like a beer cap, the, uh, the model has a, a clamp mechanism, super easy, just right over the neck of the bottle and then gently just push it down. Um, always uh, know this, if you, um, argon gas, so like we mentioned before, argon gas is inert. It doesn't smell like anything, it doesn't taste like anything, and it doesn't affect wine. Oxygen um, is not inert. Oxygen will affect wine. It'll affect the flavor compounds, the aroma compounds. It'll affect the, the acid in the wine, which is one of the transformations that takes place that we're seeing. Um, argon gas won't do that, which is why it's such a wonderful gas to use both in winemaking, but also in the Corbin. Um, if you were to press the button on this unit for too long, you're gonna inject a lot of gas into that bottle. And then ultimately what you'll find is that as the wine comes out, you may say, yikes, that's a little bit more than what I wanted to pour, in which case you might find yourself just kind of doing this, right? Just turning it back. And that's not the worst thing to happen in the world, but what it will do is it'll push some of that argon gas from the canister running through the wine into the glass of wine that you have in front of you. Now remember, argon gas is denser than air, so what it's gonna do is it's actually gonna form that same film over your wine. So if you were to put your nose in the glass, you might not be able to catch some of the aromatic complexity of the wine. So if you ever find yourself uh, putting a little bit too much gas into the bottle, you find the wine's coming out, you had enough, tilt the wrist back, and now some of that gas comes through, just do this, it's real simple. Just kind of blow, blow into the glass. You're gonna move some of that gas out of there, move some of it out, it's gonna let some of those great aromas come out. Liam, I have a question about the Coravin. Yeah. We know that it's a, it's a wine preservation system, but does it actually aerate the wine? No. Does not right. aerate. So aeration versus uh, 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 extraction is really what you're talking about. Plenty of you have at home uh, wonderful tools, uh, 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 swirlers, aerators, that all essentially do the same thing. It's all about that exposure to oxygen. One of the things about a wine like this is that even though it's well aged in the bottle, um, it's going to continue to transform once air is on that wine. And that's something that you can do real easily. If you have a great aerator, that's wonderful. It's a, clearly a, a fabulous uh, tool to have in your, in your wine drinking arsenal. But if you pour yourself a little bit of the wine and you feel like, you know, you have some time that you're enjoying it and you're really, you're, you're tasting with an open mind, you're tasting with an open palate, you're being, really being present with the wine. Um, it's fun to, 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 to allow air to affect the taste and the flavor and the structure because all three of those things are going to be affected by, by that. A quick swirl of the glass is going to just increase the rate at which oxygen is touching the wine, increase the rate at which oxidation takes place in the glass, and then uh, ultimately, I think, change both the bouquet, the flavor, and then the, the physicality of the wine. 
So no, the Corvin won't aerate it. If you are extracting wine with a Corvin, I think, it, I think it helps. I think it does help just to take the wine for a spin around the block a little bit in the glass. That's just gonna, just gonna open it up a little bit. Let some more of those one, really fun flavors come out. I have a question from a viewer who is asking, when taking out the wax from the top of the bottle, that wax dollop, yeah. will that change anything in the wine in the bottle itself? How long can I keep the wine after taking the wax top off? Yeah, Leslie, that's a great question. And I'm sure uh, those of you who are members with us who have been enjoying these reserve wines for a long time uh, have, have, have seen this wax dollop and had a couple questions about it. So this is an awesome opportunity just to address those questions. Um, it's an aesthetic decision, I think, more so than anything. Uh, it's a great look the way it, it, the way it is. Our bottle design was, was a, the, for the reserve wines was done to be a, a, a step away from our classic label, which you all know so well. It's a, a bit more modern. It's a little bit more sleek. It's a little bit more, um, I don't know, it's a taste. It's a beautiful bottle, a beautiful, tasteful design. Uh, the, the cork itself is going to protect the wine. And that's, that's for certain. The cork that's in the bottle is going to protect it. Once you've removed that dollop like this, and again, just two twists down and crack it like a beer and it comes right off, um, this wine can continue to age safely in your cellar for as long as you, as long as you choose to. No question about it. Yeah, the wax is not protected. The wax is purely a visual look. It has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the corks doing the heavy lifting yeah. of protecting the wine. Todd, I can notice the difference in the color between the 08 and the 10. Um, obviously, 08 has a couple more years age on it. With the 10, let's talk about the characteristics of the wine that we're getting at this point. Great. Well, so all three of these wines, uh, again, the similar vein is they're Cabernet-centric. So they're all about 95, 93 to 95% Cabernet Sauvignon. There's a little Petit Verdot, a little Cabernet Franc, and the 10 actually has a splash from Merlot in it also. Um, but as Leslie alluded to, naturally the wines, when they age, they get a little brickish on the rim. And the 08 is showing that, which I was surprised today when we first opened the 10, how bright the 10 is still. So it's 10 years old, and if you would have put me on the spot to guess by just looking at it, I would have got it wrong. I would have guessed five years or something like that. So it's, it's very youthful still. I'm still getting here more black fruits. It's still fresh fruit, whereas the dried fruits of the 08. So, and then I get this nice Asian spice. You're still getting some barrel component in here, some cedar, some pencil shavings. Yeah, that's, that's something that struck me, Todd. I, I caught a note of minerality, a, a wonderful granite graphite kind of thing underneath the fruit that I found to be really, really exciting. Yeah, and, but, the, and the length goes forever um, and, and it's fresh. Um, and lively energy. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased with this wine. Uh, the, the growing season was, was a little tricky for this one too. If, if you had to guess, you know, after harvest or, or during harvest, like, oh, where's this gonna rank? I don't think anybody's putting it in the vintage of the decade at all because it was a challenge. Um, you wanna talk about that a little, Davey, the growing season? Well, it, it uh, was a cool growing season. And it was a cool, long growing season. So, um, it, it didn't get all the, the heat and uh, it didn't ripen as fast as you would like it to ripen. But as uh, they talk about hang time, it had a lot of hang time. We could wait a long time for this, but uh, we also had frost earlier in the year. That's the nice thing about Winston Hill. We don't have any frost protection. We hardly ever have any frost here because that natural uh, air movement off the, the slopes, when you have cold air um, in the mountains, it, it flows down into the valley. Think which of it draws, just like, like water. It's like water. It just, it just pours right down and it and goes to its lowest spot. And we're lucky since we're up high, it passes. It visits us. It doesn't stick around and stay. Yeah. So like uh, what you do out in the flat vineyards, you have wind machines that try and suck the warm air up high and mix it up with the cold air down below. Well, this is a natural process. That cold air flowing down through the vineyard sucks the warm air in behind it. So we don't have to frost protect here. So we had a, a very cool, um, no damage. It uh, was a long season, cool season. And we got but... significant rain all the way through May. Mm -hmm. So it was a wet, it was a, it was a wet year for that. And, and a late, so thus it pushes everything back. So we're picking towards the end of October in 2010 or the 2008, we were at the, the front of October and even into September. Would you say later picker 
later, later picked grapes affects the acidity of the wine? It, it, the answer to almost every question about winemaking is it depends. Okay. And so, <laughs> um, I, and I, you know, it's just, it so does. yeah, it depends. And you can, this is remarkably fresh to me. It it's really crisp and yeah. bright and energetic on the palate, which 10 years from the year we're in now, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected that from a late picked yeah. Cabernet Grape. Right? We had a couple heat spikes early, but mm -hmm. I think the, vine, the, the grapes were still young enough and youthful enough. And they probably had a good canopy cover that they withstood it. And then the October was, was pretty mild. Okay. And that, to me, that's, that month before harvest, it's kind of, if it's mild, if you have a lot of heat spikes, you can burn up that acid pretty fast. So this, this was pretty calm going into that. Okay. There's a lot of decisions you have to make in this type of year because you can wait for the acid to go away. Right. You can wait for the sugar to accumulate. You can wait for ripeness. But when weather starts dictating to you what's going to happen, then you've got to decide, what, do I pick it now? Do I wait for it? Are there problems I need to, to deal with? So there's a lot of things that we work together on at the end of when we go to pick the grapes. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes it's the weather's nice and the winemaker says, let it hang. It's okay. Let it hang. And of course, I want it off the vine. So no, Davey there... wants to go hunting. So he's <laughs> yeah. like, let's pick this thing so I go on vacation. Right, absolutely. Has there ever been a time you guys have butted heads on a vintage? Never. Which, which, <laughs> since, since last vintage? <laughs> Not since last vintage, yes. Davey, I have a question. With regards to managing a, a vineyard like Winston Hill, which is a hillside vineyard, and then a vineyard like our Benjamin Vineyard, which is also Rutherford, but it's on the floor of, of, of the valley. Is there much of a difference in how you manage each vineyard, one hillside, one on the floor? Well, there's a lot of practices that are, are the same, but there, uh, you have different, uh, different logistics from the uh, hillside and the sun exposure on the, on the hillside and then you have the flatland that, that gets the cold, gets the heat, gets a lot of other things that the hillside doesn't get. Um, but you still have the same spray program. Uh, you have deeper rooted, probably bigger vines that you need to probably uh, sucker more, thin more. There's a lot of other practices that you may have to do in the, in the flatlands, but it also depends on the year, which one, sometimes the hillside grows more than the flatlands because of the, the air and, and sun accumulation. So uh, there are, they are always different, but it's just, uh, you've got to be on your toes every year to see what mother nature th throws at you. Hillside is different from Valley floor, yes. Now we're a little biased at Frank Family Vineyards because we happen to think that Rutherford Cabernet is the best ADA for Cabernet. Uh, you have uh, vineyards and you manage vineyards across Napa Valley. What, um, what do you think, Davey, is, is unique and significant to Rutherford compared to maybe a Stag's Leap or an Oakville or another um, cab-centric AVA? Well, I think that the terroir here is, is a little different. There, um, you, you've got an, a bigger open expansion down south of us. You have more of a sea breeze. You have trapped heat north of us. Uh, you have a nice little like a funnel coming through Rutherford. So there's always a breeze late in the day that comes through that, that helps cool the, the hot days. Uh, there's, it's just a nice area for, uh, for the temperature for the soil and for the kind of the median of everything else that happens in the Napa Valley. I have two questions here, one from Chris and Bob Hilton. They're asking, is there such a thing as an ideal weather year and what would that be like? And the other question is, do you ever, from uh, Dennis Sadamka, who is asking, do you ever wait too late to pick the grapes and then get bad weather that ruins the harvest? <laughs> so, um, <sighs> Todd and, and Davey, take those questions. If, if it could happen, we've probably done it. So uh, the answer to that one is yes. No, but we're like, uh, I think I've said this many times in our time. It's so easy to pick grapes early and it's so p easy to pick grapes late. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pick them perfect. Um, and that's going to the weather. I mean, I think the next vintage we get into is gonna be one of those Goldilocks years where the weather was pretty outstanding, especially following a very, very difficult 11 year. Yes. So we were all jumping around like little kids in 12 because it didn't rain during harvest. Um, so the, the answer Dennis's question, uh, have we wait? Yeah, that's one of our decisions. Um, early in the year, early in the vintage, I guess, not the year. So 
Harvest for us is typically September and October. So if you're picking early September, you can maybe roll the dice a little bit and say, oh, this rain's coming through. It's going to pass. The vine's healthy. It's, they're not ready now, so why pick? Let's roll the dice and let's wait till this storm goes through and uh, we'll get it later. Now, but if you're picking at the end of October, it's the cusp of November, it better be ready because you're not going to get any more heat in November. And once the rains come, usually around November, they're going to stick around and it's not getting any better. So you have to play that game every year. And again, we're so spoiled here. Um, we play this game, but I think we don't have to play it as much as our colleagues around the world have to play it. We have the best weather anywhere for growing grapes. I, I look at it a little different uh, in that I have to have a crew to pick the grapes. And you can't wait for every single grape and every single vineyard to pick at the, exactly the same time. So some vineyards, we always encourage winemakers, you know, pick out your earliest block and pick it a little early. And your best block? I don't even answer his phone, right. phone calls until he calls three or four times. <laughs> yes, yes. Todd, have you looked at the vineyard? I think it's right, Todd. Pick the grapes, Todd. Come on, Todd. Yeah, so we're, we, we uh, have that balancing act between us all the time. And, uh, and you know, we don't second guess one another. It's, you know. We're, we're lucky here at, Ruff, uh, at Winston Hill in Rutherford is this one of the earlier ripening vineyards in the valley. So I actually do get kind of my first choice of uh, picking because it's still relatively early in the Cabernet season. Um, and so I, I get to get in when I really want to. So there's not a lot of conflict. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about farming Benjamin and, and Winston, and uh, excuse me, Benjamin versus Winston Hill too with the, with the 12s, because we're doing some cool things now in uh, current days that we weren't doing back here in the 08s and 10s. That was, that was something I heard when I started at Frank Valley Rand was they said, somebody said, uh, Rutherford picks five days after Winston Hill. Everyone's looking at what we do and they make their decisions after that. <laughs> That's why we pick at night, they can't they see, can't it. see it, right? <laughs> Well, speaking of weather, it's uh, raining on Winston Hill. It's starting to come down now. So I'm really happy that we decided to broadcast yeah. indoors. I think it's time for another trivia question. Let's see who's been paying attention here. Mm -hmm. All right, what is the name of the gas that replaces the oxygen in the bottle in order to preserve the wine when using the Coravin wine preservation system? And the first person to get the answer, it looks like it is Andy Swanson, argon gas, argon gas. That is the correct answer. So you just won a $100 gift card. Uh, Marissa McCann, our marketing manager, will email you. She'll reach out on Monday to make sure that you get that. All right, speaking of the Coravin, Liam, let's go for a third time. Yeah, with 2012. Um, this you, is the, can you do this left-handed? <laughs> I don't know, I've never tried. <laughs> I've never tried, I don't think it would go very well. Uh, this is the 2012 vintage um, Rutherford Reserve Cabernet. Easy in, easy out with the needle and the dab. Boom, just like that. A little pop will give you about an ounce. If you want a second ounce, once again, don't overpress it. All that's gonna do is put a lot more gas into the bottle than you want. You want the, you want the Corbin unit to just naturally pour what it has coming through from the gas you've put in. Any extra gas is just wasted. And by doing this, guys, by being smarter with this, you're gonna preserve uh, um, the length of, of, of time that you have the canisters for, because that's an issue with these. Uh, not an issue, it's just something to consider. Each unit has uh, in the handle those canisters of that gas and that argon gas um, does deplete every time you use it. So you want to be smart when you use it. So a little bit in and a little bit out. Um, Todd, one thing that's been jumping out on this glass to me is something you mentioned, when I'm, and I'm just reverting back to the 10 because I haven't had the 12 yet, but those wonderful secondary notes from the oak uh, and, and how they're complementing the still ripe, bright, vibrant fruit. Uh, I get a little a hint of anise, a hint of cedar, just a lot of great complexity that takes the, the natural grapes that grow from the properties and then just, just layers underneath them and layers around them. Some really fun flavors and aromas uh, that really, I think, define um, the wines that we make. Why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the Oak program at Frank Family Todd and great. particularly with these wines? So. Um, they're all very similar. It's a, it's a family style. Again, we're, we're, we're looking for balance and we're looking for energy. Um, and what we find with this reserve tier is about 50% new French oak every vintage. Does the 
does the trick, and then 50% once used from the previous uh, vintage. So, um, so all these are treated basically the same. We use about 25 different French Coopers. Um, Cooper is the, the, the man that builds the barrels. And uh, all French oak, again, is, is our house style. A little more delicate, a little more elegant. And I think that shows really well in these wines as they age. Um, uh, right there, we've uh, picked, get what's great about this, from here to the wineries, 15, 20 minutes. We're getting the fruit right from Davy and his team are picking it. This is a tricky vineyard up here because they can only, they have to use crawler tractors. They have to actually pick at daybreak so it's safe. Um, they can only get about 12 tons a day, maybe 15 on a good day. Yep. So it's, it's a limited that we can get in there. But what's great about our relationship is they'll pick four boxes, so two tons, let's say, and they'll send a truck and they'll run it up. So as soon as they're, the fruit's picked, we're, we're destemming it. Um, at the winery and getting it into a tank and to start the fermentation process. And again, fermentation is pretty simple. It's just converting the grape sugars to alcohol. Um, takes a little more involvement than that. It's not as simple as that, but uh, really the, 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 the science is just, we want to get that sugar into alcohol and then make delicious tasting wines. But we can really, because we're so close and we can run shuttle the grapes in as soon as they're picked, we're taking them and getting them into the winery as quick as possible. And it's a tricky vineyard, Todd, because of the slope of the vineyard? Correct, exactly. And over time, it's naturally been terraced by the, by the tractors going down the rows. And it looks like it was terraced, but it's, it's kind of just over time has done that. And then coincidentally, with new farming, we're actually switching the vine rows to go horiz uh, excuse me, vertical instead of horizontal. So it's going up and down the rows now. We're, we're seeing there where we're gonna get better, better uh, sun coverage by the vine. It will help protect better uh, soil erosion control. Um, Davey, other things that we're seeing? Well, you can see on the, on the terraces, and this, this photograph is great because all the sunshine that comes from the east, uh, from the west onto this east fa uh, west facing slope is on one side of the vine. Yep. Where you look at the new block over here and the sun is coming down over the top of the canopy. So you're not getting sunlight right on the fruit. It's, You've got a little, like an umbrella. Correct, it's like the vine's got a hat on. An umbrella, so it's covering the fruit. The, the, the refracted sunlight is hitting the, the grapes, but not the direct sunlight. So it's like wearing a big sombrero um, and, and protecting them where uh, historically, in the, the horizontal system, we've had to farm with a, a little umbrella ballerina skirt on the one side and then open it up on the other. So just a little more so farming issues. And this, with going a vertical system, we take out a couple of the farming issues and it's all natural. Is that a relatively new approach to grape No, it's, it's, it's a little more difficult. No, but if, you, if you're in, in, in Germany, in the, in the Riesling, in the Mosul region, um, you'll see it there. Uh, the Douro in Portugal, these yeah. steep global winemaking communities are doing it. And, but they've gone back and forth. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and then it's here. And so this whole, someday when this is all replanted, because it will have to, vines are like humans. They, they live their nice life and then they start uh, declining and we'll have to make a decision someday on all this stuff. It will all be done vertical. Todd mentioned the, the trellis system that we changed so we could get some more shade on it. Mm -hmm. um, there are some vineyards that we pick twice because the exposed fruit gets so ripe so quick we have to pick that side and leave the shaded side to pick in a week or two later just because it just needs more time. Right. Here we've got the shade just about right and we thin it just about right and we we work on it. Right. But it's, uh, it's pretty well balanced. The age of the vineyard balances itself. But that better. shows just such incredible respect and care for the fruit and the land to send a crew out twice when the crew could do the same amount of work in one day. So going up and down the hill, we eliminate that process. Right. We can pick it all at once. That's great. This 12 is awesome. Uh, it's really bright, really vibrant. It's got a ton of youthful energy in its fruit, yet still rounder and silkier like all of these aged calves have really shown. That it's that softness of tannins and that, that management or mitigation of acidity that makes these, oh, to me, just so enjoyable and just expressive in terms of the flavors that they're delivering. So again, 12 would have been our Goldilocks vintage, I think. It wasn't, wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold. cold. We had plenty of crops, so growers liked it. 
the quality was great. Winemakers liked it. Um, so, so it was fun. So uh, this has great natural acidity to it still. And I think this is still a puppy. I think this is going to run for a while. I, so, I, so if you are Corvinning these bottles, if you're tasting through these with us using the Corvin system, here we have the opportunity to say, all right, let's think about what Todd just said. It's, 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 it's youthful. It's bright. It's still a puppy. It's got plenty of gas in the tank. Uh, we can now tuck this aside, say, let's continue to let it develop and grow in the cellar, revisit it again in two, three, five years, see where, see where that is done to it. And you can with the Corbin, but again, if you have three bottles, yeah. my advice, open one, try right. it and see where you go. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely right, back. because yeah. it, it still is it's just so, so flavorful and so expressive today. I think um, our video may be freezing a little bit here and it may have something to do with the rain, um, but I think the audio is fine, so we'll keep going. Uh, Mike Ober is asking about the cork on the 2012. He says, why does it look so much lighter and thinner than the 2010 or the 2008? Great, so I can answer that. It, it's, a, it's a color only uh, difference. Um, thanks. There's a 12. Yep. Um, this, based on sediment, this is the eight, and then this would be the 10. Great. So we, we mainly use two cork companies. Um, I don't have my readers on, so I can't tell you who, who's who, but uh, I can see that one. I'm not that old yet. <laughs> so let's see. Oh, I am that old. I can't even see this one. Uh, so, uh, so two same cork companies, different cork companies. Corks have, have a parafilm treatment on it to, corks are natural, but they're treated with a light wax uh, treatment to help when, when you saw Liam pull them out, that lets them slide. If you don't have that little wax and silicone treatment on it, it's a light, light, light spray, um, you will never get the cork out. It'll stick It'll in stick. there. So it, it's purely for the ease of extraction of the cork, and those can add a little different color. There's some different washes, corks are washed. So there's peroxide washing, SO2 washes, and that will taint the color, taint, tint more than taint. Yeah, sorry, that's a bad word for yeah, corks. Um, tint the color a little <laughs> bit also. That's, that's mainly the difference in okay. color. Uh, this is, uh, we talked about San Giovese very briefly, even though we're tasting Cabernets today, but with regards to the Winston Hill Vineyard, and we do grow San Giovese at the top of Winston Hill, the question is from Chris and Bob Hilton, who are asking, why is San Giovese grown at the higher elevation? Davey? Well, uh, the uh, San Giovese was planted um, back a while when, uh, when they were looking for a new variety to bring to the market and they planted the Sangiovese up there and it doesn't make really a whole lot of sense to plant Sangiovese on the top of a mountain because you would think that the Cabernet is a better location for the top of the mountain but this Sangiovese has proved itself to be exceptional Sangiovese it's just absolutely phenomenal and uh, if we ever tried to pull that out i think uh, todd and rich would kill us yeah, to yeah. try and, before we tried to pull that out but i think some of the club members might too because it's very popular yeah so it's it's a fantastic sangiovese why it's there uh it was planted before i even got here so i i i think they were trying something new and different and it really worked out really well, well. in the in the late 80s early you know napa was going to be the next tuscany yes you know yeah. now we're now we're the next bordeaux maybe but 20 years ago are uh, 30 now. Yeah. Um, I, I am that old. Um, <laughs> 30 years ago, we were going to be the next Tuscany. So San Joe was starting to get a little popularity. Yeah. And um, that was our experimental little block of it. And uh, fortunately, due to Rich's uh, foresight, that we didn't pull it out and put Cabernet in there because it is a great wine. Yeah, okay. But it wasn't uh, just us. I mean, San Giovese had a moment. In, in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a, a many, many young vendors and, and, yes, and winemakers. But, it, but moment was maybe a little longer than it had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it went as quick as, quick as it came. Yeah. So, except okay. for us and, and maybe a handful of others. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, what was it? Now, Atlas Peak was kind of the, the home base of that movement. Was Correct. there something about that region? Well, it was, it was an investment with the Antonoris. Yeah. And, right. and they brought right, San Giovese in. And right. there's stories of guys climbing the fence to get the root, the cuttings, and things like that so they could have the Antonori clone of San Giovese. And it was a, the Grosso or the this, and this is the Grosso. And uh, um, so 
Uh, yeah, it was hot. It had its moment. Yeah. And then it went away. So that's kind of because it's it's hard for us to you know in Napa Valley. I mean, again, we what we do, we, we love what we do, but it's a business. So right. um, the world classic Chianti's are twenty five dollars or less. And then if you're growing Sangiovese in Napa Valley, you can't buy land and plant Sangiovese. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was a it was a hard deal all the way around. Right. So it works for us great. We have a little bit of it. What we what we grow that year is all we make. And it, it, in the taste room sells it all. Yeah. Well, and the, so in the wine club. So it's really become a club exclusive wine. Yeah. yeah. Now, and and just so it's, it's got this little cool thing here in our winery, but it, 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 you have to have that well, integrated system to make it work. Yeah. Right. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, some of our viewers are asking if these three library wines are available for purchase. And the answer is yes, they are. Well, quantities last because we don't have a lot of them. Obviously, these are library wines and they're in very, um, they're very limited. Uh, but if you are interested in purchasing the three of them or, or each one individually, um, they it, go to our website, frankfamilyvineyards.com. Go into the wines section. You'll see virtual tasting series. And under virtual tasting series, you'll see Cabernet Retrospective. And you can purchase either the package. You can purchase the packages package with the Corvin, or you can purchase uh, these wines individually. Um, I do want to say that uh, Felana Bouvier, shout out to Felana, who said, uh, scroll down a little bit there, Marissa, on the, uh, on the chat. There we go. Fantastic and incredible educational discussion. No worries on video. This is perfect. We're learning so much about how special Frank Family's winemaking is and the extraordinary passion that goes into making the best Cabernet. Well, I like that endorsement, Felana. Thank you very yeah. much for that. And I think um, it's time for another trivia question. Let's see if you were really paying attention to how Todd makes these Cabernets. The question is, what is the oak profile that is common in all three of these wines? First person to answer, and you can't win twice. So for the two previous winners, you can't win twice. Not, not today, anyway. Um, okay, well, uh, yes, it's French oak, but that's not, okay, that's not exactly, what's the profile? Let me give you a hint. It's percentage, percentage. Is it new? Is it used? What's the, per there we go. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, so David Van Nord, yes, 50% new French oak. You are correct. David Van Nord. 50% new French oak, and yes, 50% used once. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, I think, Marissa, is that, are, are we qualifying just 50% new as the winning answer? I think that's good, okay. All right, so it was David Van Nord. So David, Marissa McCann will reach out to you. She'll send you an email with your gift card, uh, and you can use that towards any purchase on Frank Family Vineyard's website. Um, I think we have one more trivia question, but before we do that, why don't we launch our poll? Let's see what you thought about today's educational experience. Um, if you're tasting along at home, which vintage did you prefer? The 08, the 10, or the 12? Have you used a Corbin before? Yes or no? Going forward, what days of the week work best to host our virtual tastings? Is it Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific time? Is it Saturdays at 2 p.m. or Sundays at noon Pacific time? Did you hear Frank family is accepting reservations for the summer? Okay, so no, we have not been given the okay yet by the state to open our tasting room. We are hoping that that happens very soon as restaurants in Napa Valley have been given the green light to reopen. But we are accepting reservations because we know we've had a ton of emails and phone calls from guests saying, when are you reopening? We were ready. We want to come back to Napa. And so the only way we can do that is by appointment only. Um, we will have to limit the number of guests we see for obvious reasons. Um, so we are accepting reservations. So go ahead and make a reservation so you get on the list. All right. Let's see, a little more time on our poll. 
67% of you have voted. Let's end the poll. And the winner of today's tasting is the 2012. All right, followed by the 2010 and then the 2008. <laughs> but I will say it's pretty close. Like 45% say the 12 and then 36% say the 10 and then the 08, 24%. Um, have you used a Coravin before? 55% of you say yes, you have, um, but 45% say no, you'd love to try it. Going forward, what day of the week is best and what time? 30% say Fridays at four, that's sort of like a little early happy hour. Saturdays at 2 p.m., 82% <laughs> of you say Saturdays at 2 p.m. We like Saturdays at 2 p.m. too. <laughs> okay, and did we put the other question in there? Did you hear that we're accepting reservations? Well, I don't know if we have that one in there. I just threw that one in there. Um, so if you hadn't heard, yes, we're accepting yeah. reservations. We can't wait to see our guests this summer. Uh, we understand that the challenge comes with uh, uh, how, we, how we do this successfully, how we do this safely. You know, we just want to say, uh, Frank family, we're doing everything. Uh, we're, we're taking every measure appropriate to make sure that our guests and our staff uh, enjoy a safe and happy and fun uh, wine tasting experience. And I think that's the best we can do. Exactly. Uh, Todd, I want to raise a glass to you because you celebrated your 17th anniversary with Frank Family Vineyards this past week. And we couldn't be happier that you are such an integral part of the Frank family. Obviously, uh, one of the most important parts because without you, um, well, we know that great wine happens every day and it's a team effort. And Davey, thank you for you and, and everything that your team does. But Todd, hats off to you because not only do you make great Cabernet, but you make great wine across the board, starting from our sparkling wines to our Chardonnay, our Pinot Noir, our Zinfandel, our Petit Syrah, and of course, our variety of Cabernets. Um, one, of, uh, one of our guests uh, in the chat said earlier that they were drinking the 2016 Patriarch today, which of course comes from Winston Hill Block 5, which is 100% Cabernet. Right. And uh, that's also a really beautiful wine. And um, 2012 was uh, the inaugural vintage of that wine. So we're, we're happy about, uh, about how beautiful that wine has turned out as well. Um, I have one more trivia question before we wrap it up for the day. And this is really going to see who was paying attention at the beginning. Uh, the question is, which vintage received the most rain? Of what we're drinking today, was it the 08, the 10, or the 12? First person to answer the question. And we have Brian Archbold. Yes, 2008 is the correct answer. Um, all right, that's great. Anything you want to say about these three wines as we wrap it up, Todd? No, I, I love them all. It's, it, and it's a great way to look at them because you see the evolution of, of the wines. Again, we're, we're, we're living in a pretty rarefied air to be making wines off this hillside. So we're... we're I just got to get out of the way and make sure I don't muck it up. But uh, um, you can just see the depth of the wines, the classic fruit character. Um, and and um, I think the eight, I think it's starting to show that little bit of breakishness. But I think the 10 and the 12 have a long ways to run. So uh, take your time on those. Davey, as we are moving into the 2020 vintage here, uh, the growing season, what uh, are your thoughts on how the vineyards are looking at this time and what do you think we can expect? I know I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball a little bit, but what do you think we can expect for the 2020 vintage? Uh, well, everything looks good right now. Um, there looks like there's good crop. It looks like the, uh, the, uh, we're going through the uh, flowering well. Uh, I think we're gonna have a, a good crop. It just depends on the rest of the year. Uh, we've had already had over a hundred degree weather, a couple of days this year, which is like, crazy and now we've got rain a couple of days later it's going to be a strange year so I think that's going to dictate to us how great the year is going to be but Winston Hill is always great. What day should I pick? A Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> a Tuesday, yes. Yeah, All none right. of this tasting on Sundays or Saturdays. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, 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 Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday, I like that. <laughs> All right, and, and Liam, this one's for you. J.P. McLaren says that this has been a lot of fun. We have eight people tasting. We all agree that 2010 is the winner today. We like all three vintages. The 08 and the 12 are a debate for a solid number two. Uh, 
when we reopen again, I know, Liam, that you have in your library, you keep some of these wines, again, we, we've made them available on our website, so I don't know how long we'll have them, but I know that you've always got something special in your stash for those wine club uh, members or, or fans of Frank family who come to the winery and want to taste something that may not be on our list of what we're pouring that day. So one more reason to come back to Frank family. Absolutely. And I, and I love the spirited debate in, in terms of preference. But I always like to say about wine, when we talk about wine as it transforms with time, it's not a simple matter of good to better to better to best. It's about a transformation. And that transformation, uh, uh, subjectively speaking, the way we relate to that, what we think today and what we feel today, come see me in two years and maybe I'll have a different answer. I love each of these wines for who they are today, what they express today. Um, I don't look for them all to be expressions in the same way. Uh, there's great value in, in understanding that wine is, 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 is really about that complexity and that texture and that diversity and that layering uh, uh, concept, concept where multiple layers can exist within the same glass of wine. Uh, each one of these shows a different thing and each one of these shows something really special and really fun. All right. Well, Brian Archbold is asking, where's Rich? He said, I bought a oh, lot of Zin the last fun. time due to his appearance. <laughs> You're on so Rich, I think you have to make a cameo. You're not mic'd, but if you stand um, close enough to one of the others, and I know we're supposed to, no, don't stand there. Go behind the bar. I was going, <laughs> to, I was going to just say, I approve of this message. <laughs> It's um, great. I love all these wines. I, uh, for me, it's just uh, a thrill to, to watch. Davey's been with us from the very beginning. Um, San Giovese was going to be the thing right before yes. when I first bought it. We had some barren land and we put it up there. I love the fact that we have it. Mm -hmm. So many people have said, you know, mix it with Cabernet, make it this, make it a blend. It's just so great. We only make a few hundred cases a year. So something really really to do todd the wine became different when you joined us 17 years ago uh we were fooling around with it while i was in the entertainment business way back then but we became a real winery uh starting then and it's just gone on it's uh it's a kick for me liam love having you here you always i learn something whenever we uh we do a tasting with you. And one day I will figure out how to use the car of it. <laughs> My problem is so I great. pull out the bottle and I drink it all. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. Anyway, this was great. That's my cameo. Leave all right. Back to you Thank you, and Rich. I do, this has nothing to do with the wines, but I've had a, a number of comments from people saying, what's up with the, with the shovels and the ladder and where are we broadcasting from? This is our party barn on Winston Hill. It's a barn that has been here for many years and we just decided to, to redo it a few years ago and, and make it a fun little space. So because of the rain, we decided to broadcast inside today. The shovels um, really have no significance except they're there because it's kind of quirky and it's more an aesthetic thing. But um, I guess if, if someone asked, are those the shovels that broke ground on Winston Hill? That's a good story. I don't know. That's what it's, we're going to say from now on. Can we use that to embellish a little it, bit? It kills I all the so. rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're there for, for when I see a rattlesnake on the vineyard and I, I scream and call Rich. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Any, anyway, I want to thank everyone for participating uh, today, for joining us. And special thanks to Davey Pina, the owner of Pina Vineyard Management, uh, who keeps our vines beautiful all year long. Todd Graff, who makes fantastic wine all year long. And Liam Garrity, who runs our director, uh, who's our director of hospitality and runs our direct-to-consumer uh, channel of our winery. And a special thanks to all of you who took the time to be with us today. We can't wait to see you when everything opens up in Napa again and we're allowed to see you at the winery. But until then, cheers, and uh, we'll see you next Saturday. Stay healthy. Cheers. Same cheers. time, maybe the same place. Cheers. <laughs>